Hey all and welcome to Geek Freaks. We have a lot to cover today. I am Frank. We're going to start off with me and Thomas going over some of the biggest announcements from D23. Marvel, Star Wars, the Disneyland parks, quite a bit of stuff going on. We focus on Marvel and Star Wars as that tends to be what you guys want to hear from us anyways. And then I got a new interview to share with you guys with entertainment lawyer Joshua Lestine. Joshua has worked with major studios like Marvel and Lionsgate and he's been a key figure in shaping deals across the entertainment industry. We talk about his career, his approach to protecting talent, and his insights on like emerging trends in entertainment. It's a really insightful conversation. I loved talking with Joshua. No doubt he'll be back for some more conversations. As for the network, we have a brand new Who's Got Next Game podcast coming out on Friday. Challenge Accepted is going to be covering Logan, following that Deadpool and Wolverine. I mean, you just got to talk about Logan. SideQuest just put out a 500 episode Geek Freak special where I go over the history of Geek Freaks. A lot more history than I thought. Headlines is releasing the news every single day on all your favorite social media platforms and the podcast apps. And then make sure to check out our latest podcast in the network, Fandom Portals. That's led by Aaron Davies. He's doing a wonderful job over there. And I myself am one of his latest guests. By the way, while you're listening to me and Thomas go over the D23 announcements, do me a solid. On the podcast app that you're listening on, drop us a review. We love those five stars if you can, and just let us know what you guys think about the podcast. It truly helps us out. It's one of the most important things you could do to help your podcast out. All right, guys, I hope you really enjoy the show. Have yourself a great week. And covering everything for D23. Uh, there's just too much good stuff, Frank. Like, yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, you wouldn't think that San Diego Comic Con was, what, two weeks ago? Because it feels like everything just got announced for this. <laughs> right. And to think of the slate that Ball Biger had booked for two different events back to back like this is pretty impressive. It's true. Yeah, I didn't think about it. That's a positive way to look at it because I was like, man, you know, how are they going to top what happened in Hall H at D23 yeah. for Marvel? And somehow, they, I think they've at least rivaled it. Not a lot, not um, just talking about what's going on in Marvel, but like with Star Wars, with the rest of the Disney universe too. I mean, yeah, you've watched a lot more of it. To be frank, I've only watched most of the Marvel stuff. I mean, I don't know how much of that I'm supposed to say out loud, but I've seen yeah. most of the Marvel stuff and then some of the Star Wars stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Take it away on like, what do you so- think? Yeah, okay, so let's just say, like, everything's on our website. If you guys want to go there, you can check that out. Link's in the description. And then all the official (laughs) trailers are on our website as well. You can search on your own time for the ones that are not supposed to be released, which we have been watching those as well. Yeah, I haven't Um, seen those at all. No, of course not. (laughs) Uh, But let's, yeah, let's stick with, let's stick with the fandoms of of, of our geek culture. So let's stick with Star Wars and Marvel, and maybe we'll tip into some, a few other things. But um, let's, you want to start with Marvel? Would you, would you like for Marvel? Yeah. Whew. So again, I think they showed the same kind of snippet from Fantastic Four that mm-hmm. they showed at uh, San Diego Comic Con. And man, I, I think I'm the most excited about this movie. It it looks so damn good. The the vibes are just right. Um, it looks inspiring and interesting. And uh, the costuming we saw a clip from the cast who is are very much shooting in in the UK right now or in England, I think. I think in yeah. London specifically. London, yeah. But um, what's that? It's in London. They're from in London. London. Yeah. We got to go, man. If we can yeah. ever get an invite there, we got to go check that out because I think they're Absolutely. also doing some of the Mandalorian and Grogu there too. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it just, that looks amazing. It does. Uh, yeah. It, 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 the futuristic 60s vibe, it's everything I wanted out of this. Um, I, I am so excited for it. And, and we've gotten even some clearer footage too for those who didn't get to go to San Diego Comic Con. Uh, which is always nice. And mm-hmm. yeah, I just like how the family dynamic is working out so far. And Pedro Pascal as his leader, the way that um, that Ben is uh, kind of his best friend. And and one of my favorite things, too, is the fact that Johnny seems shy right now. And so you assume yeah. once Flame On kicks in, he'll be more aggressive or whatever. All that stuff is is such a good like opening to mm-hmm. Fantastic Four. I can't wait to see where yeah. go from there. You're so right. The the Johnny thing, that's still the only part of this whole puzzle that is a little confusing to me. And it's not because I don't think Joseph Quinn is amazing. I, I do. I think he's so oh, yeah. talented. Uh, Quiet Place Day One, obviously Stranger Things. Like, he's he's super talented. But I still, like, even seeing him with the blonde hair and everything, he's yeah. so shy. It's like, and we just got Chris Evans from Deadpool Wolverine, who is right. very Johnny Storm to me in my mind. Like, 
that's how Johnny Storm is to be. Super good looking, very confident, very like, I got this. So uh, this is a, a, yeah, again, he's the only puzzle where I'm like, is he going to be a great Johnny Storm? Like, I don't know. I, I guess I'm still like yet to be seen for me. The, the reason I think it's going to work well is because I can't remember his name, but the one from the bear that plays Ben in this. The oh thing, yeah, Eben moss uh, He does a great job of playing that like confident. Uh, I mean, he like the character doesn't play in, in, in the bear, right? Uh, kind yeah. of confident, kind of a pushy uh, personality. So that versus, because the way that him and Johnny work together a lot in like the comic books and in, uh, anything else you see, like those two bounce off each other a lot. They're they're usually the ones that are kind of hitting each other, like a Wolverine and Cyclops a little bit. And so mm-hmm. yeah. to start from this angle, and then all of a sudden Johnny will get aggressive over him when mm-hmm. when Ben is who was cocky beforehand has an identity crisis because he doesn't look good anymore. I think those I two see. trading places is going to be a very interesting dichotomy we see over the course of the film. Yeah, that's a good point. You're right. And and I was thinking about that too. Can Evan kind of go from being like this really confident, but like quietly confident guy to emoting? I mean, because he's going to be all CGI to, right. you know, emoting like I'm depressed. I'm sad now because of what mm-hmm. happened to me. Like, I, I think he can do it, but it's going to be yeah. it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a stretch for him as an actor, I think. And also like vice versa for Joseph Quinn. But again, I think we saw a touch of it in Stranger Things. I'm so excited about that. Oh, uh, another, yeah. Another thing, uh, I think the next thing I'm excited about is Daredevil Born Again. Yes. Uh, we're, we're getting a continuation of the Defender Saga. They brought out the full cast. We, we saw John Bernthal's Punisher. We got Deborah Ann Wolf. Uh, I'm trying to think of what Foggy Nelson's name is in real life. Um, no, I also he's know Foggy from- forever, man. That guy never has <laughs> another name again. Yeah, he's yeah. Done. Or Mighty Ducks. <laughs> too yeah. if you're like, oh, God, old school yeah, like us yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. nice but we, um, we see that they're working together right like kingpin and and punisher matt. yeah no i thought punisher? it was kingpin and punisher are working together versus matt well there's that part where they're sitting in the dining uh in like the diner and like matt's talking to kingpin and they're like um it's kind of like okay. like this weird working relate the relationship yes kind of going on you know what i mean like yeah because yeah. the worst threat coming which by the way right. that that's like some of my like favorite comic books whenever you're trying to like trying i say trying because you know it's hard but trying to stick with a run um every so often when like they have to work with magneto or they have to lex Luthor and superman team up to take on brainiac like those are my favorites because then you right away throw a wrench and everything it's the it's the one-off it's the like we'll get back to hating each other in a second but those are right. my favorite. So yes, if those two are working together, hell yeah. And could Deadpool be out for revenge and like maybe uh not Deadpool, I'm sorry, Punisher yeah, be out da- for revenge and yeah. and Daredevil's like, no, you have to go through the justice system. That would be such a good way to put those two against each other. So um and is is Kingpin his target? Because Kingpin, uh boy, he would easily be Deadpool or Punisher's target. Why am I keep saying Deadpool? But, yeah. I don't know. Deadpool is on the brain. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it is yeah, definitely a Deadpool summer, so I get that. But you're right. Got the shirt I, on I, and everything. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. You were inceptioning yourself. Uh, but yeah. I think, yeah, you know, what we were talking about, it's it's funny because, like, from, from a trailer standpoint, it's pretty run-of-the-mill. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, okay, and don't get me wrong, like, I love the Daredevil series, but it's I think it's, you were saying to me, like, off mic, it's kind of hard to translate, you know, that, that show because it's mostly yeah. story that's going to drive you, you know, it's like, otherwise you're, it's kind of like the Batman problem. It's a guy in a suit punching guys in the face. Right. And so, yeah, I, I, I think though, bringing all these characters back was an automatic highlight, but just from like a story standpoint, it's really hard to tell. And I'm also like, yeah, I'm not like sold on the story, I guess, as of yet. I know that probably sounds crazy to some people. Some of the biggest punches of daredevil isn't when he's, um actually punching people it's when he's having a conversation with kingpin and there's a like uh oh does he recognize that i'm blind or you know like this the little things it's like when you're watching game of thrones it's like some of the best parts of game of thrones doesn't have a dragon or a sword in it it's just <laughs> Cersei and Tyrion talking together and i think that's one of the highlights of the daredevil series is like this crime drama um you, you know screwing over the reporters or the lawyers that's the best part that does not make for a very good marvel trailer um but it makes for a Hell of a good March, series. Not too long. Just got to keep going till March. Mm-hmm. Got to make it through the rest of the year to get to that. That's <sighs> going to be great. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. But having John Bernthal back, and you're right, mm-hmm. like the way they look at justice, the way they look at trying to solve things, um, especially the Punisher and Daredevil, is a perfect counter 
right? Yeah. Like Daredevil pushes that line. Sometimes he skirts the line, but Punisher just fully stomps right over it. And, oh, yeah. and then, yeah. And then on the other side to that, you know, he's a villain, uh, Kingpin and Punisher. Like that's a great dynamic too. It's just, it's so good that, uh, yeah. yeah, we're getting these characters back and, and they look so stoked. Like I've seen mm-hmm. pictures of them off panel and, and the reception of them all coming on stage was insane. It, I'm super excited about this. Like, are you going to go back and rewatch all of the Defender saga? I, I probably will because I never watched the Defenders. So I probably oh, will. You ever watched like the Defender or like all of the Daredevil? I watched everything Punisher? else. Uh, I think I watched half of Iron Fist. I couldn't get through it. Um, I don't blame you on that. I did and that burnt that me Fist. from watching the Defenders. I'm like, more Iron Fist? Eh, I'm all right. I yeah. just, so I need to sit down and watch it, actually. That was like the best Iron Fist was, I think, in the entire series. And granted, I didn't watch season two but uh like because he's kind of like a side character and like luke cage kind of gets to push him out of the way it's kind of the best he is so i love, I love luke cage cool. i love jessica jones so to have mm-hmm. those two back would be really nice uh but yeah i'm okay on iron fist <laughs> i'm ready for yeah, full recast too. on they that one recast all the way uh yeah i'm i'm so excited about it. i think that one's gonna be great what about mm-hmm. you what what else did they show from marvel that you're like wow that's pretty freaking cool uh frankly from marvel that was basically it for me uh, honestly yeah. i can't think of anything else that they showed that i was what about you i mean we okay I, so i'll just say this we got another look for those of you guys who didn't see it at San Diego comic-con um mm-hmm. at red hulk and uh yeah it was the more front-facing red hulk so you could everybody could see like oh, okay they definitely are using the harrison ford uh mm-hmm. mocap for this that was cool yeah 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 the design is very much him whether it's somebody in the suit, you know, or like doing the, I can't imagine Harrison Ford's going to be running around in like a dotted suit punching people, yeah. but um, either, yeah, that looks super sick. I'm already sold on that movie. So it's kind of like, ah, you know, and, and seeing all the costumes up close and personal at San Diego Comic Con, it's mm-hmm. just like, all right, I'm ready to see these in action on the big screen. And that looks freaking cool. So um, the only thing I kind of wish they showed a little bit more of, ooh, no, no, uh, Thunderbolts. Because I wish they, I don't know if they showed the trailer for it or not, but they did show a trailer at San Diego Comic Con. Right. And that looks really, that looks really freaking cool. Because I'm surprised on paper, all of the different characters, their power sets are exactly the same. You know what I mean? Like, except for Ghost, right? So, uh, but they did a good job in that trailer of showing how they, they really look different. Like their fighting styles look different. Um, The whole scenario seems like, you know, they were sent on a mission and that they were all double crossed. So mm-hmm. that was like, yeah, I, I hope that they show more of that because that was really cool. Ah, uh, what else? I'm, I'm glad that the ghost and taskmaster are getting another shot because taskmaster mm-hmm. is, I mean, guys, he's such a good villain in the comic totally. books, uh, in the Spider-Man game. I don't know if you guys have played the first yeah. Spider-Man game. He's fantastic in that. So when it was like, oh man, this straight to Disney plus black widow movie is not really giving taskmaster the justice. So hopefully mm-hmm. we're going to get a, a, another chance to really witness how good his, her abilities are. Uh, and this mm-hmm. will be really nice. And Ghost too. What a cool premise for our characters. Yeah, right. I, I think one of the best actual like renditions on screen was uh, the Avengers game. They did a really good job with Taskmaster mm-hmm. and you get to like fight very, Taskmaster's very Black up. Widow. That yeah. one is, that he was a pretty cool Taskmaster. So yes, yeah. it's great to have like another, uh, another shot at that. And then, um, Oh, another thing that just popped up for me, Ironheart. So they showed a trailer for Ironheart. Yep. So this one actually did surprise me too. It crazy. My rankings might go as far as like trailers go. It's not doesn't mean this is how good the show is going to be, but it's probably Fantastic Four, then uh, hyped for Ironheart, and then Daredevil underneath it. That uh, is because insane. Iron- <laughs> yeah, I know it sounds insane to say, but like like I said, like just from a trailer, it wasn't like sensational Ironheart was surprisingly more interesting than I thought because my expectations for Ironheart was so low. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't think it was going to be cool by any means, but it kind of, it looks sick. Like there's a vibe to it. it it's very like Ryan Coogler. Like there's a stamp of his on this trailer. I feel like yeah. from the music that they choose to re okay, how do I adjust with life um, post whatever happens in Wakanda forever? And that, that she gets all of her equipment taken away. And then you throw in the hood into it, which is an awesome Marvel villain. That's yeah. True. And uh, what's his name? Anthony Ramos. I love Anthony Ramos. I've loved him from um, Hamilton and everything. So he looks cool. And they're doing like a full on 
comic accurate hood, it seems like. So, man, I, I'm I'm kind of excited about this. Man, I, I, I swear I saw them filming this probably four years ago. Yeah. It's like they've been working on this thing forever. Because I remember like when the first images for Hood got out, it was like, oh, that's incredible, you know. But it was like, man, that had to be like during the pandemic, I think. So right. it's been a while. Um, I'm hoping this is good. I, I mean, I've really am missing the Iron Man vibes. So mm-hmm. if you can give me that, of course, who doesn't like Black Panther vibes with the Wakanda Forever stuff? The only thing is that her suit in Wakanda Forever was awful. So yeah. it really put a bad taste in my mouth. And I am assuming many others in mm-hmm. like, oh boy, I'm not like this. Even when you're watching Wakanda Forever, you're like this stinks of Disney Plus. So yeah, I'm really hoping that we true. can kind of shake that before it actually comes out. Yeah, that's true. I think that they've kind of corrected some of it. Like if you look at yeah. the suit in the trailer, it very much looks more of an Iron Man yeah. homage type of suit, right? I mean, so that has like the bulky shoulders and everything like Wakanda Forever. But uh, yeah, I, she, it looks pretty cool. Like, I'm on board, you know? It's her kind of favorite versus... looked like the uh, cheap knockoff of Power Rangers. You'd get at a flea market or whatever. And you're like, oh, no, mom, <laughs> yeah, this isn't yeah. the right toy. <laughs> I know. I, I let that movie kind of pass as it was like, you know, during the pandemic and had to stop and start. Like yeah. it started and then the pandemic happened and then they had to like tear everything down, stop. And then had to rebuild it all like the, the sets and everything and then get it going again. And then it's still like that movie. I can't watch that movie without crying. Like it, it, oh, it yeah. gets me every time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but I, I, I dig Riri. I think she's kind of, she's cool. She's just like, a, you know, a very modern take on what, uh, you know, a genius could be. And I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, it surprised me. Looks good. Uh, her character, especially out of suit, comic book wise and stuff like that, I think is going to be so good for the MCU. I really like the, the, her, um, like her push for STEM. I think her and Captain or uh, Miss Marvel together, that would be a friendship I, I want to see yeah. on screen so bad. So, yeah. Yeah. I know I'm trying to think. I mean, just the combinations that we're going to be getting from in Doomsday and then Secret Wars. Yeah. It's like, gosh, if yeah, Riri with anybody, Miss Marvel with anybody. Uh, we're going to want that Young Girl. Avengers after that for sure. No doubt. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, Haley Steinfeld, Phil, uh, yeah. yeah, Florence Pugh, like, holy crap. It, man, Marvel is is so back, even though I don't yeah, feel yeah. like it went anywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So let's let's start shifting over to Star Wars because I was more excited about the Star Wars stuff, frankly. Uh, we mm-hmm. got our first clean trailer for Skeleton Crew um, ambling all day on this thing. It definitely feels like it's a 1980s uh, kids movie that I grew up on, of course. Some space adventure uh, where mm-hmm. they're just kind of discovering things. Goonie for sure. They find a spaceship and a force user, which I don't think we ever heard about before, with uh, Jude Law. So uh, what was what do you think about this? Yeah, I think you nailed it on the vibes. It was surprisingly fun. Like the kids mm-hmm. look like they're actual kids and that they're about to go on an adventure they didn't plan for. And it looks good. It's it kind of shows like a Star Wars suburbia, which is interesting. I know, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is kind of Stranger <laughs> yeah. Things too, by the way. I also throw out Stranger Things. Oh, yeah. that, that first season nowadays it's so out of out of that. But that first mm-hmm. season when it was a bunch of kids on bicycles, that kind of was what we got in this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can see the cars kind of going down the street and the kids, you know, saying, like, I want to go on a real adventure, not, you know, something I read in a book. I, I love yeah. it. I think that it looks really fun. Um, I got a few chuckles out of me. We get to see a few aliens that we haven't seen in some other Star Wars property lately. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I don't know what that alien uh, elephant uh, kid is, but that's kind of cool. Yeah. I don't like, know, but I can't wait to get my Funko Pop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this just looks like a good time. So I, I'm super on board and did not expect Jude Law to be a Jedi. Just thought he that, was going to be a scoundrel. Yes. And, and I wonder if he's going to be full-fledged Jedi or if he's going to be a Jedi in hiding. I'm not entirely sure what the time period of this will be. Um, or if he'll just be a, a, a force wielder that's trying to figure it out himself. Like, that would be very interesting as well. I'm assuming with him being a force wielder, one of the kids will be a force wielder too then. Because then it'll be like, oh, you know, you have the force, but we, but you got to hide it. You know, that I could see that all being one of the stories. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's cool. Like, e- even if the kids didn't have the force, like having a force user who is now like the steward of these kids, mm-hmm. um, who, and, you know, will have to do any, anything and everything they can to protect them is kind of interesting, too, that they're all going on a journey. Like, I don't know if we've really done that in Star Wars, but um yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I know Star Trek's done it and stuff like that, but it'll be cool to see it. And I want to go back to uh, Aaron from Fandom Portals. He was on Geek Freaks and talked about how 
uh, when you have kids nowadays, it's kind of hard to show them some of the, some Star Wars because uh, some of the Star Wars isn't necessarily made for kids anymore. Like Acolyte, definitely not really a kid's show. But when he grew up, he the reason he got into Star Wars because he watched it with his dad. Um, and so he's looking forward to this to be able to show that his kids like, hey, this is Star Wars. This is Star Wars that we can watch together. And this is how you get that next generation into Star Wars, which is how you get Star Wars in the future as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, good point. Look at, uh, I, which is, I think is like the next thing we're going to be talking about, the Mandalorian and Grogu. It's like that, mm-hmm. that to me does not feel like that's for kids at all yeah. at this point. You know, there, there's Funny deep enough. cuts. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like, you, cause you're taking so much from the Rebels universe um, where a lot of those kids, quote unquote, have grown up. They're probably mm-hmm. like young adults now. And then, uh, you know, hitting the big screen. It, also, that's a pretty big move. Taking a Disney yeah. Plus show and now turning that into a movie. Uh, you know, yeah. it seems like it's vice versa normally. Uh, you know, you, you do something on Disney Plus and then you put it in, on the big screen. But um, is that what I said? <laughs> I think yeah, I'm all no. tipped around. But yeah, it just like seems like an interesting move. Well, and I'm wanting to see. So the thing I want to see the most is um, first off, I want to see them filming on location for uh, yeah. Mandalorian. Which right. it looks like they're doing uh, the the rebel base, I think, is on location, like the rebel hideout or whatever. It kind of reminds me of like a, um, a Casablanca cantina kind of thing that they're all hanging out at. Uh, and mm-hmm. so uh, I think that's on location and that bigger budget. I want to see what the bigger budget looks like in the Mandalorian because they already do a hell of a good job with the budget they do have. So if you add a bigger right. budget, what are we going to add to that? What are the fights going to look like? Uh, that'll be mm-hmm. really cool. And this is going to be a day one watch for me. I'm definitely going like yeah, premiere yeah. day for sure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It, it, it just blows me away. Like Pedro Pascal, he was in like two of the major announcements, you know, and yeah. coming back. I know he's mostly going to be the voice of it all, but having, uh, you know, Fantastic Four and this come out in the same year, it just seems so insane, along with The Last of Us. So, yeah. uh, but it looks like, I mean, one, he's kind of going back to the roots a little bit. Like, okay, it's just us two. We have to figure out our own way through the galaxy. I like yeah. how it's kind of getting back to the roots of what the Mandalorian was. And now it's turned into this whole like rebels part two kind of situation again with um, what, what is her name? It's not uh, Soka. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 But we have, um, we have Throng Bo-Katan. back. Bo-Katan. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a uh, Throng's right. going to be the main villain of this whole thing. And that definitely mm-hmm. is rebels. And then I, do you think they're going to use this movie? I don't think the timing works out. Anyways, where they might use it to get Ahsoka back over here. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I could see it leading to the end where she comes back. If, you know, if, if it is all about Thrawn, um, we know what happened, how Thrawn got back to like the normal universe. So, you know, it would make sense that she comes back at the end or something like that. Maybe Grogu is the reason why they're able to come back to our universe. Maybe. And we have Ezra over here too. So then we're going to have Ezra and Grogu, both force wielders working together. Nice. Oh man, that'd be cool. I don't know. It looks super sick. We got to see some at ats in there. Uh, you know, there's like different I know, right? Like anytime <laughs> you can see like that kind of stuff from the original series, but yeah. done now, like to your point, in the bigger, badder budget, it's just awesome. Uh I, I have no idea how this story is gonna go because at, the last time we see Mando and Grogu, they're just sitting on their farm and like Grogu's picking up rocks or like yes. frogs. You know, I, so I think- it's like Right. And I think what we got from the last, so we have uh, Jean Carlo Esposito's character off the board, but what we mm-hmm. learned during that season was the fact that there are like six or seven, whatever, um, generals of the empire that are doing different aspects of the empire. We know from mm-hmm. the future movies that only one of them is actually successful. And it's the one that's working on the cloning system, but there's the mm-hmm. other ones to hunt down that are not there by the time the first order comes around. So I oh, have yeah. a feeling that this movie will be, Mando and the uh more importantly Paul Song Hung Lee's character um going around and like let's finish off these other generals and then the last one to survive will actually be the one that like has thrown in the cloning program and it's like oh we didn't mm-hmm. get that one in time you're right right and somehow Palpatine returned yeah <laughs> yeah oh boy <laughs> yeah uh but that you're right that's it that'd be sick I love it you're right and that that fills that gap um one other thing too that was pretty cool from Rebels is that we got Zeb so I like oh, I know. <laughs> which was definitely missing, I think, from Ahsoka. Right. Yeah. Because you thought he was going to pop. He was in the last season of Mandalorian for like a second. Mm-hmm. Um, and the then so we thought with Ahsoka. Yeah. At the canteen. Exactly. So um, yeah. Zeb is such a good middle child character 
in Star Wars. Uh, he's he, Ezra's kind of the favorite one, everybody's favorite. But then the guy that's always mm-hmm. picking on him or kind of like messing with him and stuff like that, it's definitely Zeb. And so, uh, yeah, it is going to be and Sabine too. He works well with Sabine. Ah, I can't wait for his interactions. He's one of those characters you just want to see talk to other people. That's the best yeah. part of him. Yeah. So true. Yeah, so true. It's going to be great. I, I, yeah, I, I'm just, this was all vibes, I think. I, I, again, you know, it's all speculation on this story, but mm-hmm. this was like a, a great teaser trailer because I'm, I'm hooked. I want to see what yeah. happens. Uh, yeah, it, and Favreau and Filoni, uh, for me, have not really missed other, I, I'll let the acolyte kind of slide in some ways <laughs> because it was maybe a Kathleen Kennedy I don't know, passion project. I have no there idea. There are but. plenty of good things out of the Acolyte, though. You and me both talked about it, guys. We have an entire playlist mm-hmm. of the Acolyte. You guys could listen to that now over on Spotify. There yeah. are definitely some pluses, especially like the lightsaber duels and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, getting more of that would be, man, I, I'm, I'm excited. This is going to be great. What I'm probably most excited for, didn't expect this, and you just watched the trailer for it, and you're like, yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, Star yeah. Wars Rebuild the Galaxy. This is a Lego movie. Yeah. And it just looks so fun. It's actually a four day event. So it might not be a movie, it might be a mini series. But what happens is some random kid pulls the corner piece or whatever, uh, mm-hmm. and the entire universe gets flipped around. So it's a whole bunch of what ifs. We've been wanting the Star Wars what if. This is kind of it. And yeah. so we get Darth Jar Jar finally. We get uh, one of my right off the bat, they show like the ad ads change to have like the Jedi logo on the side. And it's like, oh snap, they're not the good guys. So this right. looks like it's just going to be a blast. It does. It, it looks so fun. It, we, we were talking about it too. Like, uh, we were, you know, the, the whole uh, Lego thing and Lego movies were just fantastic because they're very meta. It's kind of like yeah. Deadpool, but for kids, you know, like, and now you throw in Star Wars on top of that. We got Grievous, who, uh, you know, seems to be fighting for the good guys. Um, that's we're getting, so cool. <laughs> right? I know that's yeah. sweet. Like, a good Grievous is like a really sick idea. I think that's yeah. awesome. But also getting Mark Hamill back as Luke Skywalker, who also calls out all the dumb stuff that happened over the series, is just fantastic. It's like, you know, (laughs) again, Deadpool calling out, like, you're kind of joining Marvel at a low point. You know, it just works so good. (laughs) I like, by the way, that that joke I saw recently, Sean Levy talk about it, which I gotta give a damn shout out to Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman, who did Mm -hmm. not need to share the spotlight with Sean Levy, but you notice how Sean Levy's, like, in every post that those two are sharing? It's really cool to see the director just as much as a part of the celebration as it is the, the two main actors, which is easy to right. have them be part of it. So Sean Levy, right. I think is now becoming a superstar because he's actively out there as much as uh, the two actors, but totally that's best friends, best friends yeah. getting to make stuff together is like, it's always cool. But they were saying like, yeah, we wrote that line like three years ago. We didn't know where we were going to be. <laughs> and it was like, it worked out pretty well. <laughs> Dang. Sadly. Yeah. There's a bunch of stuff in that, that movie that landed a little too good. <laughs> You know, yeah. uh yeah rp oh, to hugh jackman's marriage but like yeah. the, they, that was um, great yeah, yeah i was like dang they even got that one in there Jeez. Um, during the interviews too they've been doing a, like joking around like the blake lively thing and stuff like that and yeah and then he's like oh yeah i've been missing my wife for a long time whatever during the interviews and then he's like and hugh has been hanging out yeah savage i love it but yeah, and I think that's the way you got to go about it. Like, look at John Favreau and Dave Filoni. Like, I know Favreau is an actor; it is all right yeah. too. But it's like I, I know him more in a, in a lot of ways as the guy who kind of launched the MCU, and also yep. the guy who's kind of launched new Star Wars. And they, like, look at Filoni. Like, Filoni yeah. j- literally is just behind the scenes a producer, a writer, a creator. But like, I he's like a rock star now because of what yeah. he's been able to do, bring Star Wars back up. And it's like the, the creator excuse me, are just as much of these celebrities now. And yeah, I love that that Star Wars is doing that. It's it's funny because to me, Favreau has always, like I've always introduced him as like, you know, the guy that did the Iron Man movies. Right. Um, but there's a movie that is, it, it's, I love it so much. It's so much fun. It's called Couple Retreat, Couples Retreat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's hilarious and in that. He's hilarious <laughs> in that. He's just like the sex hungry guy. And so so uh, watch that, guys. He is definitely an actor and is all right. Him and Vince Vaughn especially have kind of been a duo for a long time. So yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's cool to see him kind of be able to stretch his muscle every so often with like yeah. being happy LaHogan. But yeah, he's also just such a great director. Cool. I mean, yeah, Disney is so lucky to have him. And in on paper, he doesn't seem like an obvious choice for Disney, but exactly. it, it works. Yeah, yeah, it really works. So, uh, yeah, this this movie looks so fun or a series or events. Again, I'm not sure how they're going to break it down over four nights, 
Mm-hmm. I can see them maybe doing like half an hour episodes each time. But yeah, are you a fan of that release strategy of like the consecutive nights? I, I as a single dude who who doesn't have to worry about putting kids to bed and stuff like that, I love it because it does make it like a full yeah. week event. The what if you brought up a good point about the what if to me, that was a blast because it was over Christmas. So it was like, OK, Christmas with, you know, these random cousins was stressful. Ah, luckily, I got the what if to watch tonight. And it's kind of a good way to re- unwind. So for me, it's mm-hmm. great. But I do know a lot of people who have families like you with your wife and stuff like that, who's like, oh, it's hard to find the time to like consistently watch a show for multiple nights in a row. I yeah. can see why that'd be a pro- problem. Yeah, I think that might have been the only Marvel thing that I didn't watch like at night, like every night it, mm-hmm. it dropped because like Christmas was busy and like we were running yeah. around to different family houses and stuff. So, yeah, that was like the only thing. So I wasn't in love with that release strategy, especially when it was over seven nights. We'll see how it works for the Star Wars thing. But yeah. I mean, for you and me, it's like we're going to we're going to have to watch it right away in order to like talk about it. And everything, yeah, we'll, so. we'll do. We'll have to do it after the fourth night. I think that's the only way to feasibly do it because it's going to be tough <laughs> right. on us. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'll, but you're right. I'm going to have to double on it. So it, it could work out really good. But again, this is like light watching. It's a lot of fun. Uh, yes. it, it just the jokes. It's so meta. It's just, it looks like it's going to be a blast. It Lego really jokes is so freaking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Other Star Wars stuff. Let's see. We had skeleton. Oh, crew. And- we had the mid- and or. And I, I yes. didn't I didn't get to see anything from it, but I I mean Andor is my favorite piece of anything Star Wars that's come out in, in 10 years. Uh yeah. and I would say Mandalorian's right behind it, but Andor by far is my favorite, favorite Star Wars thing. Um it seems like that was a pretty it got a good reception. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and the footage that I did see of it was very light, mostly just showing off uh Cassian and stuff. Um mm-hmm. it should be very good and it's gonna be re- leading up to Rogue One immediately. So in prep, mm-hmm. I'm going to rewatch Rogue One because I haven't watched it in a long, long time and kind of so be good. ready for where it's going. That'll be really fun. Yeah, I, I watched Rogue One getting ready for Andor season one. And I was like, wait, how the heck does this match up? And it's like, we're, we're getting there. I think season two, yeah. I think this is the last season. But also I read that it's going to be taking place over four years. Like there's going to be a four year time Makes jump. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. In the show. That's worked out really well for House of the Dragon, so I, I could see it working out really well for Andor. Uh, man, and I love it. I love Diego Luna. Like he just, I don't know, he something did. about that guy. He, he he's more Han Solo to me than the actor who tried to be Han Solo in Solo. Yeah. You know, like that's yeah, such a good point. That is a great call out. Yeah, yeah, he's like that perfect scoundrel, and like luckily getting by everything, and luck luckily escaping, and things yeah. kind of work out, but barely by the skin of his teeth. So yeah, it's. Oh, I can't wait for Andor season two. Okay. So shout out another movie. It's, what, it's me and Jonathan's like favorite Tom Hanks movie. And that's high praise right there. There's a movie called Terminal. Have you had a chance to watch that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love Terminal. He's yeah. in it. And he's such a nice little guy who's like got a crush on a girl. And so you just want to mm. give him a big old hug. He, it's like the first movie I can remember him from. And he's just like, I like her and I like, and she likes Star Trek. So I'm trying to learn about Star Trek right now. And they're like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a, that's a challenge in the future. I have not watched that in forever, but I remember loving it. Oh yeah. I think me and Jonathan watch yeah. it once a year easily. Cause it, cause it's just so, the characters are so well done and everything like that. So yeah, I'm definitely going to challenge you to that. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yep. So Star Wars brought it. I, I think, man, it was two for two. Marvel crushed it. Star Wars crushed it. What were some of the other announcements or things that you're like, wow, that was that was really good. That caught what card. stole the show in the beginning was Incredibles three got announced. They're working on that now. Uh, that's a biggie for for anybody who's kind of a, a, a Pixar fan. That's one of the originals. Um, I'm happy it's, to see the was, family come back. Yeah, it was the Fantastic Four for me on screen done right before yeah. the Fantastic Four. It had the right? best family story. Yeah. Um, and then also, if you're talking about Pixar, getting back into Pixar vibes, which has been a concern. Um, because it felt like, oh, Pixar and Disney Plus didn't clash well. So Pixar has now got a section of themselves that's kind of being done for Disney Plus. So they're not abandoning it, abandoning it as what was originally uh, purported. Um, so they do have a couple of things, Win or Lose and Dream Productions that are going for that. And then over at, uh, they're making Toy Story 5, and they're bringing back the legendary Andrew Staten, who is the director for the last uh, movies as well. Um, so that's really cool to see them bringing back, like, hey, we're bringing back the big guns for this. Uh, LAO Which, got announced. A new movie, uh, Hopper, has got announced as well for Pixar. Hopper, what's Hopper? They just showed the title card. They really marveled that up. Uh, oh. Where they're just like, "This is coming someday." <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't remember. I think I fell off on Toy Story three, so I haven't seen yeah. what happened in the last one. 
what do you think about like is four? I don't know. Four is absolutely good? worth a watch. It's a good movie. It's just not. It's hard because it's like it's not as good as three or one or two. Mm. I would say it, it's so freaking good, but it's also like I mean you're comparing it against masterpieces. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm excited for it. I think uh, Pixar has needed some some new movies again. Look how mm-hmm. good Inside Out two is done. But yeah. although that's kind of following an already established IP. Um, I'm excited to see the original Pixar content. Anytime we get something like brand new, I, yeah. I'm, well, even, if, even if the movie's good or not, I'm always excited about it. Like one thing that kind of caught me off guard was Elemental. Where, did you have a chance to watch that? I didn't have a chance to watch it. To me, it felt like Osmosis Jones a lot. So I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get to it eventually. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it was actually really good. Like I, I randomly had like a Tuesday to just go watch it. And I, I really dug it. I thought it was good. Oh, okay. and then, That's good. Yeah, that movie slowly got better. But then you see movies like a Buzz Light, Buzz Lightyear, I think it was, yeah, yeah. or Lightyear, and then that wasn't as good. Um, but I'm excited for the original stuff. I think it's smart that they're leaning into what's worked for them. You know, uh, Incredibles, Incredibles is like, it is incredible. I, 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 like, yeah. I love the Incredibles series. Just that world is awesome, too. The, the last thing on the other side of the animation that I want to make sure to call out is um, we have, uh, oh gosh, I just started this, I had it in my head and it just left me. Not a, Moana 2, thank you. We had the Moana 2 trailer. Um, it looks like they're bringing in more of the wonderful music. Uh, it looks very good. This story feels natural. I kept seeing, you know, God, guys, if you're, if you're in our business, you see a lot of other cre- content creators that you're always digging for the news, latest news and entertainment. So many people have been pitching that like, oh, Moana and Maui have a baby. That makes no sense. That's not what would happen. And so finally that we have a story trailer out, we're like, yeah, right. And so finally we have a story trailer. We see that she needs help from a, uh, from her demigod again on this big mission. And so then she calls from Moana or Maui to join her. And it's like, okay, perfect. Um, so everything looks like it makes sense and stuff. And it's got this own lore to it. And yeah, that looks good. And then uh, we got like concept art for Frozen 3. They showed a lot off. It was really good. Yeah, I finally watched Frozen not too long ago. I think last year. And I was like, okay, I get it. I see that. The I first did. Frozen? Yeah. You just watched I, it? I mean, I don't have kids and like, yeah. I don't, you know, it's like, I'm not going to fully watch those movies unless like, it That's really funny. looks interesting. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I kind of understand the hype. Um, Moana, I, I definitely understand it. it you know, yeah. it's a underrepresented part of media with Polynesian, Melanesian, Micronesian culture. And uh, even though I didn't particularly get hooked by that movie, I see mm-hmm. why people do. Um, the music is a ton of fun. Do they show anything? Ooh. Ooh, this is going to lead into my next thing. So we did get a piece of Pixar that looks like, or I guess Disney, that's coming to live action, which is Lilo and Stitch, which also that's takes right. place in Hawaii. Did yeah. they say anything about Moana, though, being live action? Because I know they had talked about that. Before uh, that's showing. still in the works. Yeah, yeah. Ha- they haven't showed anything off. But yeah, we got, we got our Stitch, though. What do you think of the way he looks? I think mean, he looks good. Yeah, me too. My mind instantly went, though, to like, they learned from Sonic. I swear to, I thought the same thing, man. <laughs> right? I was yeah. like, oh, they're just fully leading into the cartoon aspect. Because if you try to make Stitch too real, like I, again, you see some concept art online. You're like, man, Stitch in real life would be horrifying. So yeah. I think they did a good job of like making it cartoony, but still realistic. Yeah, he looks, he just looks like he's ripped off the cartoon and that's fine. Um, I hope we get right. so much Elvis music. Like that's one of the best yeah. parts about the original is, mm-hmm. um, I mean, Guys, maybe I'll make it public. I have a Spotify playlist. It's like a lot of Disney songs uh, for mm-hmm. whenever you just needed to kind of like unwind. And yeah, a lot of Moana and a whole lot of Hawaiian uh, roller coaster ride going on, man. And oh, so go. much good stuff. Yeah. 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 No, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, um, come from a big like Elvis family and my, my dad and it's like they all love Elvis. And it's just mm-hmm. crazy that the history that would be like a fun side project. But the history of Elvis with Hawaii there's like a long story history there. And obviously yeah. you got blue Hawaii, that movie and everything, but um, yeah, I, I think that's a great playlist. You might have to share that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the last kind of geeky thing I think we should touch on is Tron Aries showed off its first trailer. Uh, we have, so I was very excited about this as a nineties and two thousands kid. Like this is my high school. So freaking out nine inch nails is going to be doing the music for this movie. Yeah. Oh, freaking cool. <laughs> Did that's you say cool. like laser show where they use the lasers to reveal it? on the uh, thing oh no. you gotta see it it's so freaking dope <laughs> okay okay yeah. i'm gonna check that out but i think that's sick i nine inch nails uh from the from the trailer right like we 
for me, it's always big. It's like, what are you trying to show us? Like, is it spectacle? Yeah. Is it vibe? Is it action? Whatever, right? And I felt like this was such a good vibe trailer. Right. Just the music felt like dark and brooding. And then you were explaining it to me because I forgot what happened in the last Tron. Do you mind like catching me? Oh, and, absolutely. And everybody too. Yeah. So with, with Tron Legacy, the ending ended with uh, like, oh, we got our first, um, I can't get the actual name for him. I'm going to watch Tron Legacy again, maybe today. But um, where we got our first computer outside of the system. And uh, it was seen as like, oh, wonderful. Finally, they have some freedom. But then this movie's like, well, there's bad people in there too. That's what they're fighting the constantly. And one of those gets out, played by Jared Leto. So if you hate Jared Leto, get ready. You get to hate him some more. And using some of the most iconic things, like we see one of the uh, chakrams and we see the, the bike as weapons in our world. And like it was used in one point, like they, he turns it on for a second and then shuts it off the, the infamous laser beam that goes behind the bike and it cuts a cop car in half. And I was like, that looks, that's beautifully, that looks so good. So I'm really excited to see what that looks like, them pay, playing around in our world. And then they showed off Jeff Bridges, which uh, for those of you guys who watch Legacy know that there's two versions of Jeff Bridges, Bridges, the good one and the bad one. The good one is like, we have to stop him. So it's like, yes, he's going to be pulling together forces to stop the bad guys that have escaped. This looks, I mean, if you're a Tron fan, like me and a lot of my friends, this is, it looks so freaking good. Yeah, it, it did. Uh, the bikes in the real world, like to your point, and just slamming into cars and everything is so yes. cool. Like using that as a weapon too. Uh, it, I, I just love the visuals of Tron. Well, they're like, yeah. I don't specifically like remember the story. That was a little bit like before my time. And I remember jumping into the last movie and liking it, but I didn't like walk away loving yeah. it. But just that visuals now in our real world, quote unquote, is just going to be sick. Um, I think yeah. I even saw Evan Peters. I might be wrong, but it looked I like he's he going to be, be our new guys. protagonist because right. uh, the last protagonist is, I know he's not a part of this movie. Um, and then the last movie to uh, legacy like that, because they kind of like pick a guy or a, a group to be the comp uh, composers. The last one was Daft Punk. And I remember so well, like right. Daft Punk's songs from that were like hardcore. My playlist for like the next year and a half yeah, like, yeah. were part of my gaming list. You know, like when you need like yeah. the gaming music, they have was all right, of them. Right. And so I'm like, so happy that nine inch, like if they could get some system of a down back too, I would be set, <laughs> you know? <Wow. laughs> yeah. Damn. That's like serious. Uh, early two thousands, just heavy yeah. kind of electronic metal. Um, but this would be sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm on board with it. I, I, I love uh, Jerry Leto as a villain. I think he's yes. great in uh, whatever it was, Cyberpunk. Not Cyberpunk? Something 2049. Um, uh, Blade Runner. Blade Runner. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm on board. This looks super cool. I'm going to call it now. So, guys, uh, next week we have Logan coming out. We're taking the week off as we kind of you know, like relax. from. So this is bonus, but relax from the crazy last two months we had. Uh, but I'm next good. is Logan. Then you're going to challenge me. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm challenging you to Tron Legacy after that. So we're going to okay. start building that hype up. That'll be fun to watch that again. So that's perfect. And I'm picking a TV show. There you go. Gummy <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> bears or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I know, I'm going to close with a weird out just to keep it simple for us. Heck but, yeah, uh, I'm dead. I'm excited. Man, yeah, it has been an insane time. Uh, you know, People are so out on Disney, seemingly online, and, and maybe we live too much online, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm pumped about this. I think Disney really brought it from San Diego Comic-Con to uh, this uh, D D23 event. Man, I, I'm so excited. There's so much good stuff coming up out yeah. of the next few years. It, yeah, we're so lucky. I, I hate to sing the praises of billionaires, and I've, I've said his name far too often amongst all the podcasts, but Bob Iger, really, we're feeling it now. Uh, when that mm -hmm. Chappic, Quiddick, whatever guy's name was, I can't remember his name, Chappic, yeah. uh, when he took over and I was like, oh, okay, interesting new take, you know, oh, he's going to be leaning more on Disney Plus and anything like that. Bob Iger came back and he's like, no, we're going to do things that people like. And it's like, ah, that just feels right. And we're seeing it here, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, finally, Tron things... is in production. Like it was so long, yeah. not production stuff. Now it's like, we have a trailer finally. So yeah, you're, so many cool you're things. You're right. Yeah. And it, you're so right. And then also like making things events again. You know, yes. like, oh, yes. right. Like, yeah, we look forward to the Mandalorian on Disney Plus and everything. And we look forward to a lot of these Marvel stuff, but it needs to culminate in something exciting. And I yeah. think that th that is the thing that Disney does so well. It's like these events and we're, mm -hmm. we're going to get it. And I really feel it from these presentations. Like Disney Plus is going to have a ton of things that are going to be awesome to look forward to. But there's going to yeah. be reasons to go back to the movie. And I, I don't know. I'm just like, I'm so pumped about that. Dude, okay, so they, we know where D23 is held. It's where BlizzCon's held, right? 
I'm trying mm-hmm. to figure out where the hell they had that room because the room that they did like the announcements in that mm-hmm. looked like a full on stadium. And yeah, was, like, how did center. they do that? Oh, what it, was that? What it was? Okay. Yeah, so it's where the Anaheim Ducks play, and it's not okay. too far from there. It's like 15, maybe it's got to be like 15 minutes away from like Anaheim Convention okay. Center. Yeah, and so you could you could get separate tickets. Like you could go to like the normal like exhibitor pass mm-hmm. um, thing, and you know it's very much like a Comic Con. And then you have the at night presentation that was at the convention center where you were right. Like, you know, BlizzCon has that separate presentation room um, yeah. kind of in like that culminates, I think, in like the last day or something or like. Yeah, right. it's like the, the Overwatch day. rooms there and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But they also had shuttles going to the Honda Center, which was like 15 minutes away. So that's cool. You, yeah. And that was like a separate thing you had to buy into. So mm. they definitely made some money. Made on some money. D23. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I now now that I know that and to your point, it's like. I think next year I can go just for the presentation, like the big Same. presentation at the end of the night. And I, yeah. I think we'll, if it, it wasn't for my wife being out of town and like us moving and everything, I would definitely have tried to go to this. But I think next year, God, ugh, it's going to be next year is going to be an insane time to be a geek. Oh, yeah. It's just God, what, a, what an awesome time to be living in, man. I'm so excited. Today I'm with Josh Lestine. How you doing, Josh? Hey, Frank. I'm doing well. Hey, uh, Geek Freaks. Thank you for having me. So excited to be here. Of course. Josh is an entertainment lawyer, a very busy profession, as we were just talking about with the last four years in Hollywood uh, kind of rebuilding. Can you kind of give us a brief uh, description of what that would be, entertainment law? Yeah, you know, it's really different from most people when they think of lawyer, they think of court and judge and arguing and guilty and, you know, all of that Mm -hmm. stuff. That is not at all what I do. I am strictly a what I call transactional entertainment lawyer, meaning I'm a deal maker. Um, I negotiate deals. I draft contracts. I draft deal memos. I work with actors, writers, directors, celebrities um, in their own personal engagements, whether that's, you know, in front of the camera or or behind the camera. And then, you know, working with larger production companies, studios and media companies to help supervise the legal affairs and deal makings day to day on any given project. Um, so, you know, a lot of people don't think about it, but when you're you're watching something on screen, like your your Marvel movie, for example, you know, literally everything that you're seeing that appears on screen has to have had a contract at some point. It's had to have gone through a business and legal affairs process. It's had to go through some form of deal making. Um, and I kind of sit at like the uh, uh, the hub or kind of like the time variance authority if you will kind of outside of the production kind of overseeing supervising day to day working with you know the 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 holy triangle if you will um boots on the ground physical production guys the guys with the with the cameras the the lights equipment the actors those physically on the ground shooting day to day working with them in relation to, um, you know, the suits at the network or the studio, the guys controlling the purse strings, those that are controlling the budget and saying, you know, what we can and cannot spend on this or that. Um, and then finally, you know, your head creatives, your showrunner, if it's a television show or your directors and, and producers, if it's a feature film. You know, it's those three entities all coming together that make a film or TV project. And my job is to kind of play monkey in the middle, if you will, yeah. or 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 uh, rodeo clown to get all of those people together. Larry, Curly, <laughs> Mo, clod their heads together <laughs> and, and, and get deal making done so that, you know, the content that you enjoy that I enjoy that we all love can be on screen, whether that's, you know, on Disney plus or in the theaters or on YouTube or on this podcast. Even. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I represent a lot of different types of, how do you say medias, I guess, you know, whether that's traditional film and television or, or, 
um, podcasts or singer, songwriter, musicians, uh, EPs, music producers, um, influencers, uh, you know, anyone who, who monetizes their personality, so to speak, yeah. you know, if, if they're getting into day-to-day -day contracts, they, you know, should have somebody looking over those contracts on their behalf. And so, you know, I've worked with a number of recognizable studios that, you know, you probably all are familiar with. I've worked at Marvel Studios. I've worked at Amazon Studios. Uh, and then, you know, for the last four years, I've run my own law firm out here in Beverly Hills where we do a little bit of mix of representing uh, talent and, and companies like we talked about. So, you know, like I said, it's very different from from suits or, you know, presumed innocent or whatever it is that you're watching. <laughs> latest courtroom drama. Um, but, you know, honestly, if you've seen Deadpool and Wolverine um, that came out this past weekend, you know, it, it's it's funny. A movie like that could have not existed when when we were kids growing up. No the level of inside knowledge of what you, you, you need to know about Hollywood and the entertainment industry and just the jargon and the and the references and stuff like it's it's incredible to me that a movie like that can stand on its own two feet. And mm -hmm. I was watching this past weekend and I was like, you know, if, if I didn't work in this business, I don't know that I would get all of these jokes. But but that is more uh, a, akin to what it is that I do. All of the yeah. Hollywood back and forth drama you see about rights and reversions and you can play with these characters, but not those characters. That is very much my work. It feels like for Deadpool and Wolverine, like first step get a bunch of lawyers in a room and see what we could even do. Because back in the day, it was exciting when like G.I. Joe's and Transformers did something together and they're owned by the same people. And for this one, you had three different studios, one being bought and whatever. Yeah, it, it had to be pretty complicated for the lawyers. <laughs> yeah, I don't envy uh, being a Disney lawyer uh, for, for multiple reasons, for multiple reasons. <laughs> yeah, it's a busy time for them. Um, okay, so, you know, we talked about how you're dealing with these three different ass uh, you know, assets of filmmaking, really. Uh, with the recent strikes we had last year, were you pretty involved in all the, the strike business or at least trying to give some advice where you could with the actors? You also have like IATSE out there, too, that was, you know, being impacted. How does that how do you uh, get yourself involved in that? So so, you know, the guilds themselves all have their own representation, and I'm actually very close with some of the attorneys that work for SAG and work for the WGA. And so to that sense, you know, I, I'm I'm. I'm I'm very much impacted by what's going on. Um, I had a lot of writers who client who their client writers whose projects got stalled. Um, I have actor clients who couldn't work during that period of time. Um, I can't say that I personally had a hand in the negotiations between course, yeah. Duncan <laughs> Crabtree and the and the AMPAT, but um, you know I was there on the picket line. Um, I was outside Disney, I was outside Warner Brothers with my clients, you know, trying to show and advocate support, um, you know, in addition to to being an entertainment lawyer, I also teach at Los Angeles Film School. I teach you undergraduate um, uh, filmmakers, um, entertainment business it's an entertainment business degree more or less so we have a lot of a lot of thought theory and discussion as it relates to the issues that were being you know protested or or striked upon as it relates to ai and things like that yeah. um uh, and you know I, I could write a whole entire book about all of that stuff but we'll 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 save that for another time yeah. um <laughs> but at the end of the day you know the th the changes that we've experienced in Hollywood over the last, I mean, yeah, the last four years have been extremely impactful with the pandemics and the strikes, but even going back, you know, to, to the very early days in my career, you know, I moved out to LA 2010, 2011. It was just off of the last writer's strike um that took place um and it was you know a very very different time in hollywood you know iron man one with robert downey jr had just come out you know two years before that and it, we mm -hmm. were seeing just this this new wave of hollywood and by the time i graduated law school you know um um streaming 
was 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 a thing that was never and never around before and and what we call you know high budget premium SVOD television subscription video on demand your your house of cards orange is the new black um man in the high castle which is a show that i worked on you know those were really first of their kind back yeah. in 2012 2013 2014 and now we are 10 years later 2024 we are seeing the end results of a lot of that experimenting a lot of that <clears throat> um pushing the envelope in terms of television SVOD television streaming television your your high budget netflix and apple and amazon shows um you know we're at the end of this 10-year experience and they're starting to realize that the profitability of those of those projects is 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 fewer and farther between it's, it's a lot of money for your uh dragons <laughs> <They're>, yeah. <laughs> al although i would say that the dragons the dragons probably get a pretty good roi but i, I don't know about the, the the lord of the rings but the, yeah. the amount of money that they're putting on screen now isn't necessarily making sense towards what they're getting in terms of roi uh, mm -hmm. it's a, a part of a longer discussion about how television and hollywood makes money in general but but just the changes in hollywood from 2010 2014 2024 you know it's 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 incredible um how much things have changed josh you're starting like 10 episodes i want to discuss <laughs> i want to make all these different episodes with you now <laughs> right off the bat uh let's let's go back to your time at school actually because yeah you went from iowa you came on out here to uh, hollywood and then uh you went to pepperdine uh you you were in school at a very interesting time because i think hollywood like you were talking about is shifting from you know broadcast television being a mainstay like your goal is to get on tv and now you have people who are making their start them on youtube and they're like you were on tiktok and you want to get to youtube type of thing uh how did you adjust especially with you learning at a, at a time when all that was changing so you know just being flexible and being where the audience is and and watching what the audience is watching and then just being a fan of, a, of myself you know i mm -hmm. i would say as a personal consumer i watch three to four to five hours of youtube for every one to two to three hours of netflix you know what i mean yeah. and so it's just oh, yeah. it's realizing that the consumer tastes have changed the the trends have changed um but then also realizing you know it that there's a much longer game here to be played. Um, I, I do feel very strongly that filmmaking, good filmmaking in general is an art that will never go away. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, it, it really kind of makes you see that what is good is good across time periods you know what i mean you can go yeah. back and watch movies from the 20s 30s 40s 50s and what good is consistently good um and and while the consumer trends will change as it relates to things like tiktok and influencers and podcasts and how we spend some of our our leisure time that way i don't think we as a society will ever stop consuming traditional film and tv if you want to call it that but do you feel like uh, a lot of the Hollywood, especially maybe the older branches of it, uh, are starting to realize how valuable things like YouTube are? Um, I'm looking at like Dropout, for example, is a streaming service basically built on YouTube that's finding its success with being small. Do you think that, you know, say Universal can adjust to that? I don't know if some, some of the larger institutions, I think, will be very, very slow towards turning a a eye towards building out more content channels on digital streaming or di mm -hmm. digital, you know, YouTube or whatnot. I don't know that the, how do I say the outside of your Mr. Beasts, there hasn't been a clear sign that they're able to monetize that in a very yeah. successful way. I think sure. Someone might be able to crack that cookie, but what you're talking about is more kind of like mobilizing niche audiences, which mm -hmm. I think is really the is not the thing of the future it's what's already here it's what people are right. already doing it's like you know i again going back to what i was saying in terms of watching a couple hours of youtube a day i'm watching five hours of youtube 
but my five hours of YouTube is very different from your five hours of YouTube. Exactly. And the content creators that I'm watching are so niche that they may only have, you know, a couple hundred thousand, if maybe a million followers at best. Yeah. But that's that's my little niche corner of the internet. Um it 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 helps day-to-day creators, it helps day-to-day artists. It helps people who want to make a living doing this kind of stuff. Um, It gives them an opportunity that I don't think's ever existed before. But at the same time, I think that it makes it harder to to stand out and become ubiquitously popular, ubiquitously famous. You know what I mean? Like, like, of course, there's not so much of a general consensus as to what is popular as there once was because we're all kind of in our own little niche communities. That makes so much sense. Yeah. You can't, you can't find a way for something like universal or whatever to make a profit out of just such a niche little audience. Uh, Yeah. You almost need to build a platform for them to be on, but something like Google has already been ahead of that. So um, yeah, it's interesting to see these worlds collide and see how they can intermingle and stuff. Very interesting. Uh, So you have worked in your earlier careers. You worked with the creative artist agency, Lionsgate, Viacom, CBS, uh, with those like major studios you've worked with, what are some of the takeaways you've gotten from those? You know, it's it's really just the amount of excellence that you bring forth to the job. All of those companies just demand such a heightened level of professionalism and excellence that you know, being a, a, a farm kid from small town <laughs> Iowa, you know, mm-hmm. growing up in town of three hundred people, I I. I don't know that I knew back then what I was signing up for, but just, you know, learning how to, to swing, to swim, being thrown in a sink or swim environment and, and, you know, kind of, how do you say, Mr. Miyagi wax on wax off. I had some yeah. really, you know, it, I'll be honest in, in the early portions of my career, I took my lumps. I did a lot of unpaid internships I did a lot of odd jobs that, you know, a a lawyer or a law student, law clerk, you know, you wouldn't think would want to do. But, you know, Hollywood is one of those places where you really have to pay your dues. You really have to know your stuff and you really kind of have to to rise up in the ranks and start out at the bottom. Um, And companies like Lionsgate, companies like CAA, you know, they they really do recruit only from the best of the best. And it's kind of like uh, sword sharpening sword, right? In terms of all of us working together and all of yeah. us rising up together. And it, it actually works out pretty cool because, you know, I'm I'm now 10 years outside of my first job at CAA. Um, and a lot of those um, people that I worked with at CAA originally, they're still either my friends, my clients, they refer clients my way, they're agents now, they're managers now, they're writers or development executives in their own right. Um, And we've all, you know, spent the last 10, 15 years cutting our teeth, trying to move up and rise together in the entertainment industry. So it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's awesome to see people want to, you know, be, very good at their jobs um yeah. and and all work kind of in in concert towards a larger goal which is you know like i i think that anytime you're working on a film or tv project you're you're kind of subservient to the larger project at hand or the 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 story that you're trying to tell or whatever so yeah um, and it sounds like yeah. a lot of it's about community uh, you know community or these connections that you're going to need and the ones you formed early on are still paying off today Oh, goodness. I call it seed planting. And, you know, you mm-hmm. never know when you're going to meet somebody in 5, 10, 15 years. Um, they, they could turn around and you'll be doing a, a deal with them. You know, mm-hmm. I was um, I signed a new client a few months back uh, and who, who was auditioning for a show. Um, the producers for that show happened to be the producers for one of the very first shows that I worked on when I first moved to Hollywood 10 years prior. Um, hadn't worked with them since, but obviously remembered each other and remembered working with each other. Um, and it just made that deal making go that much smoother, that much friendlier. Um, it's a very small industry, you know, uh, uh, as it relates to to uh, us kind of all being in short connection with one another. 
Yeah, yeah. Especially out side. here in LA, yeah. Hollywood, Beverly Hills. Speaking to that, actually, we, we were talking, uh, I talked with a recent interview about how Atlanta is kind of becoming a big spot and Toronto, you know. Uh, do you have connections that you have to kind of spread across the country now more so than just in LA? I do. Um, and And how do I say, you know, since I've been out here in 2010, 2011, 2012, though, those hubs have all been very, not well established, but, but are, were already kind of going, already establishing themselves in of their own right. So mm -hmm. I've worked to cultivate relationships in a lot of those territories like Atlanta, like Vancouver, um, New Orleans, New Mexico, and then some other places abroad. Um, but it's it's always at least since I've been part of the industry felt like a very international collaborative community, um, and I have clients all around the world filming in all sorts of different countries and territories. So you never actually get to sleep. You got that phone on that pillow next to you. Then <laughs> uh, I, I've learned to compartmentalize, and and we, we call it the bat signal. You know, call once, twice, three times, and I'll pick up depending on the yeah. <laughs> the level of emergency. Uh, so that, that could be tough on the sleep. Uh, let's go over some of the big projects that you've been, I mean, you've been with, involved in so many projects, but some of the people might recognize these. We got uh, Avengers Earth, Mightiest Heroes, a show that people should be, should have watched for sure. Uh, the Simpsons, we've got Orange is the New Black, uh, Transparent, Mad Men, loved it. Uh, then big movies like Age of Ultron and Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, which of these are your favorite? What did you take away from these big, big projects? You know, um, going back, you mentioned the Simpsons, um, and I think I saw that on on your guys's profiles. One of your favorite TV shows as well. Mm -hmm. um, the Simpsons is just something that I can always turn to as a source of comfort, and yeah. like I can just always put it on the background. It will always make me laugh. You know, after thirty six seasons or whatever it is, I'm always discovering new episodes, even to this day. Yeah. Um, and it was, I, I think, working on. Um, so, so I worked for, um, I worked for stars this was many, many years ago, but I worked for stars, which was owned by anchor Bay, which owned film Roman, the animation studio. And that was the animation studio that did all the animation work for the Simpsons. And mm -hmm. I remember getting this assignment and it was the first like assignment that I, I got that I was really like, Whoa, like, this is so cool. Um, and it was a uh, 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 animation vendor service agreement between basically the Simpsons and Robot Chicken. Um, wow. They were engaging the producers of Robot Chicken to create a couch gag scene for the opening montage, the Simpsons, you know, the, the couch gag, you know, whatever. And yeah. so just like, you know, it, it's 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 a little silly, a little nerdy because like I'm a lawyer, right? And it's just like pen and paper and all this stuff. But to see these things, to see how this looks on pen and paper and to know, oh, like somebody's got to contract this person and they got to hire them to produce animatics. And it's got to go through this approval process and they get paid, you know, this much on signature and this much on delivery of first draft and final delivery. And like, just like all these little kind of ins and outs and weird stuff that you don't think about as being a fan. Um, I find that weirdly cool, nerdy, yeah. interesting, you know, um, I, I, again, going back to age of Ultron, I got to work on the VFX deal for the, 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 the physical asset for the people who created the Hulkbuster armor that they would then, you know, take all of the different uh, uh, 3d shots they would put in the CGI so computer cool. and they'd render it <laughs> on top. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's really that kind of behind the scenes stuff that got me into this to begin with. You know, yeah. As a kid growing up, I think I was always more interested in watching the the behind the scenes or the makings of or the bloopers or the interviews, yeah. the, the commentaries that that went along with movies. Right. I was always so into seeing how they made the Death Star how they made the X-Wings, how they made Dagobah and stuff, um, you know, along with the movie itself. But just seeing that behind the scenes stuff was really cool. And now I kind of have my fingers in everything um, because it's my job to sometimes wrangle in the art department 
and the props department and locations and equipments and actors and hair and makeup and, you know, yeah. get all of these different uh, departments making sure that they're doing their jobs and doing things correctly, at least as it relates to contracts, deal making, protocols on set and stuff. I, I, I'm fully there with you. There's so many times where I'm, you know, talking, I'm the annoying guy that's like, hey, by the way, this actor and that director work together on this other movie. And, <laughs> and that's how I'm right there with you on all that. That's great. Um, well, but it's it's such a small town and that's how it works. You know, I just had to do something today where some, uh, I, got, I signed a new client and they're like, hey, we look at this deal and it came over from another client. And so I had to text that client and say, you know, hey, look, hey, we got a conflict here. And it's just that, you know, everyone in this town, it's very incestual in terms of working together over and over. So, yeah. Well, speaking with new clients, we're in an age now where uh, just the right TikTok video will get you popular enough to where you have to actually start, you know, worrying about yourself a little bit. At what point should you, as a content creator type, uh, start looking at getting uh, law services? It's really tough to say. Um, my short answer is that, you know, it's never too early to start building those connections. If that's what your ultimate goal is, is to be a media personality, to, to make a living monetizing your talent for lack of a better word, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's never too soon to start cultivating and building those relationships. But I mean, if you're, if you're making 75 to a hundred thousand, if you're, if you're making your primary living off of your talent, I think it's very appropriate to reach out and at least start a discussion with an entertainment. And then how does that, how does that evolve over time? Do you start giving them advice on how to protect themselves at this date? Or are you also kind of like, Hey, I know this person or that person who could help you grow. How involved do you get in that person's career? So, you know, I, I don't step on the toes of a manager or an agent by any means, mm -hmm. but you know, I only take on clients that I'm very vested in working with directly I only work with clients that I truly firmly believe in their goal and their mission and their art and what it is that they're, their, their talent. Right. right. I've kind of alluded to it several times. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, to that end, I'm not making money. If my clients aren't making money, you know, that, that's, that's the, the most beautiful thing about my job in terms of being a lawyer. Most lawyers you call when you have a problem, most lawyers you call, because you got in trouble and you're going to court and they make their money off of people's misery and suffering. I make my money when people are making movies and getting hired for gigs and, and yeah. being hired for modeling jobs and writing jobs and stuff like that. So generally speaking, when people come to my office, it's for good reasons, right? It's because yeah. they, they found a way to make money off of their talent. So, you know, um, uh, to that end, I, I try to, do everything within my brain wheelhouse and power um, to help my clients succeed, I guess. Yeah. What are some of the common pitfalls you see for some of the uh, newer content creators? Like, for example, uh, one of the things I've learned over time is, hey, you might want to register your, or buy the license for the music you're about to use and stuff like that. You Things that you might not realize at first. What are some of the common pitfalls you come across? Um, You know, just... <laughs> For, for smaller content creators, it's really just little things like just even reviewing your own scripts or transcripts to make sure that there's not anything that can be seen as well, maybe slightly defamatory towards hmm. somebody else, making sure that you have like, you know, proper clearances if you're showing artwork in the background or, or you know, having on high profile personalities that may may require an appearance release of some sorts, um, you know. Learning, learning, you know, in terms of signing brand deals and endorsement deals that, that, that not only focusing so much of how much you're getting paid, but when you're getting paid, the triggers of that payment, you know, someone who, who produces contents or cuts or reels or, or things of that nature, like how many cuts do you have to turn over? How many edits do you have to do? Um, those are kind of some of the pitfalls that I see, see younger content creators walk into. Yeah. So many things that they wouldn't even know. And here you've paved the road, seeing it a hundred times, you know, see other people do it. So it's great. And, and, you know, to be real honest, I think the biggest thing, the, the biggest 
I don't want to call it amateur thing, but like the biggest thing that young, young artists should, should learn is to just ask that, you know, like yeah. uh, empty, empty mouths don't get fed. Um, it, it, it really, you know, if there's something that's going to make your art, your craft, your services, if there's something that you need to perform your job well, be communicative of that. Life is a negotiation. Everything is a negotiation. And I understand that it's sometimes scary to like put forth that, that kind of like, oh, you know, I need X, Y, and Z thing to make this deal happen or whatever. Um, but, but being open, honest, communicative, and, and having a dialogue about what your needs are, that's probably like the biggest amateur mistake. You're not, you're not vocal enough about, about what it is that you need. Yeah. Now, four years ago, it was probably the hardest time to start anything, but you decided to start Lustine Entertainment Law. What a tough job to be like, hey, you know what? It's a pandemic. Let me start a new business. What do you do? How, how, do, you, how do you decide to do that? Um, not by choice, a little bit more by <laughs> okay. circumstance. You know, I yeah. was, I previously was at another law firm where I was outside counsel to a large studio for many years. Um, and I kind of decided that it was time to move on from that. And I was interviewing at a lot of different places and I, um, was, was courted by Viacom CBS who was going through major corporate changes, <laughs> um, and had just merged. CBS and Viacom together yeah. at the time. And so, you know, at the height, uh, uh, November, December, 2019, it was looking like a really cool place to potentially go and start in 2020. It was going to be a new year. Um, and, and they were, you know, really working on some really cool and interesting stuff. Fast forward to March of 2020, the pandemic happened. Uh, they had a mass shutdown order across all, you know, everywhere, right? Not alone, just Hollywood, yeah. but for myself in particular, because what I do is so intricately tied to day-to-day -day filmmaking. <clears throat> um, my department specifically was put on hiatus and then eventually let go. Um, so, you know, I think I was furloughed or, or laid off throughout m the most of the summer of 2020, but then by fall to winter 2020, going into spring 2021, um, production started to pick back up again. The industry started to turn around just a little bit. I started to get phone calls. I started to get inquiries from potential clients. Um, and it just was like, you know, I, I, this feels like the right time to do something different, to go out on my own, to try something for myself, to bet on myself. Um, I don't know that I'm going to have another opportunity where, you know, we, I had just gotten married, but I don't have kids yet. We have mm -hmm. relatively lower cost of living relative to other people who live in LA and stuff. And I'm like, I want to take this PM bowl on myself. Cause I know even if I fail, I'll, you know, be glad that I did it. But if I succeed, you know, in in 10 years, hopefully I'll have built a very cool entertainment law firm, very cool business, um, you know, that as we've alluded to many times throughout this podcast, the entertainment industry is just constantly changing. Um, and I'm very much kind of in between this uh, uh, old world where I was, you know, trained by more legacy media creators trained in more of the traditional film and television world but at the same time i still have my foot in the door in the new media and, and how things are done now so you know um it just felt like a, a very proper time to kind of be that um hopeful hopefully one of the the founding law firms in, in a new era of hollywood yeah, it seems like you and uh, Listine Entertainment Law, like it would be such an asset to some of these bigger companies because you have your youth. You see things as a consumer with, again, those four hours on YouTube, like myself. That's my primary entertainment source is YouTube. And so there's an, uh, an insight that you have that I think is not innate to maybe just a big law firm somewhere. Yeah, and you know, honestly, you can ask a, a hundred different entertainment lawyers, and you'll get a hundred different answers. But the, like, you know, the, I think that there's some entertainment lawyers who really like just being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I feel like I wear many different hats between being a lawyer, being a therapist, being a creative, being business acclimated. You know, I I very much fancy myself a a a cinephile. 
uh, if you will, and, and very much try to keep myself in the know so I can lend those services tangentially to my clients in addition to being a Yeah. That's amazing. And also, yeah, you, you mentioned Cinephile. I, I, it was on your bio as well. And I've been watching that lightsaber this entire time. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of, what, what are you collecting nowadays? So I collect uh, Marvel Legends. Um, oh nice. gosh, and they're all around me right now. Um, I primarily collect Mar Marvel Legends, um, mm -hmm. and then you know I have a, a a good stack of Dragon Ball Z SH figure arts. Um, I used to collect Legos, but man, those are hard to keep, um, oh. you know, organized and together, and pieces yeah. start falling and breaking off and stuff. Um, uh, I, I think the wife will kill me if I collect anything more. So I got I got pretty much all of the Marvel heroes and villains that I mm -hmm. want. So maybe shy or two or three, but, but yeah, that's, um, I, I, I only have maybe five or six Funko pops. Those aren't mm -hmm. Funko pops behind you though. Those are, something yeah, these else. are all, those, these are all Funko pops up here. Yeah. Those are all Funko pops. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Legends though are such a great way to, I mean, they're so detailed. They did a great job of the legends run. Those are good. I love those. Well, it's so funny. Cause I mean, in, we probably don't have time for it, but the history yeah. <laughs> of Marvel legends is so intricately entwined with the history of Marvel studios. And myself, you know, I started collecting Marvel Legends action figures in 2004, 2005. Um, so very young when I was a kid growing up. And then the, mm -hmm. the Toy Biz brand went bankrupt. And then that's kind of what also spurred the advent of Marvel Studios and bringing on all these licensing deals and creating that into a film franchise. But it really wasn't until Hasbro picked up the license again in 2014 that they continued making the action figures and i think i want i started recollecting the line in 2016 um yeah and i've been collecting ever since so yeah that's cool yeah i it just it's fun to know that someone who's helping you know work with marvel on one side is a fan on this side and we see it with a lot of things like kevin feige and stuff like that and i know you've you've done some work there was something about just the, I know we're towards the end here, but you're hauling a poster that was signed for him. What, what, can you tell us oh, a little bit goodness. about that? So, so I was an intern at Marvel when they got bought out by Disney and we mm -hmm. were making the move from the Manhattan Beach Rosecrans office to the Burbank lot. Um, and it was just some hot summer afternoon or whatever. And all of Kevin Feige's signed movie posters, like the, the, um, the framed ones that he has hanged in his office with Avengers and all of the Avengers signed, they were no, down okay. at the at the bottom of the Frank G. Wells building, which is the, the business center on the Disney lot. Um, and the office assistant at the time, she was a good friend and she was like, you know, a hundred pounds soaking wet, if that, and these are just <laughs> ginormous, heavy framed movie posters worth hundreds of thousands of dollars you know they this was at the height height yeah. of marble um and she's like josh can you help me take these up to kevin's office and i'm like in my suit and tie and just like a little nerdy legal intern and yeah i ended up carrying up like all of kevin's like signed posters into his office uh which was i thought pretty cool um but that yeah, so that's cool. my kind of thing. <laughs> that's a great party story right there. <laughs> yeah. And then fast forward 10 years later, and I'm negotiating deals with his brother. So it's, you know. That's amazing. Well, uh, Josh, it has been fascinating talking to you. I really appreciate you hanging out with us today. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, uh, Geek Freaks. You know, I'd be happy to come back and talk again. Of course. Um, so yeah, no, love, love the conversation. Wonderful. Everybody, in the links in the description, you're going to find Josh's social media handles and, of course, his website. Check it all out, guys. It's super interesting. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.